Welcome to Nitpicky Nerds. Today, we're talking about logical fallacies. And how understanding them can improve your commander experience. I'm your host, Joe Cherries. I'm your host, BZ, and that makes us the Nitpicking Nerds, reminding you that we have a Kickstarter running through September 21st, and that it is funded. However, we have awesome secondary goals that we'd love to achieve, so go ahead and out, check it out in the description. You'll love it. It's going to be great. Stretch goals. Stretch, they're stretch goals. It's going to be great. There, it is going to be great. Also, TCG player link in the description below. You click on that, and suddenly, if you buy anything through that link, you're supporting the Nitpicking Nerds making the magic purchases you were going to make anyways. Wow. So... This video is a weird one. What are we doing? Well, we're talking about logical fallacies, and we're applying them to Magic the Gathering, and more specifically, Commander. Yes, it turns out uh, logic kind of uh, applies to all of reality and everything you do. It's one of our favorite little, like, subtopics to go into, so we're going to combine it with Magic and just talk about how to, like, up your game and your play experiences and your, basically your thought processes when it comes to Commander, because I think this is some useful information. First, we've got to define what a fallacy is, for those who might not know. It is a failure in reasoning which renders an argument invalid. Right. So a fallacious argument cannot be accepted as true based on the reasoning you used to get there. So using a fallacy doesn't mean you're inherently wrong, but at the bare minimum, it means the way you got there is incorrect. You can't justify it. So you're going to have to rework your uh, thought process for whatever. And it's not, this doesn't just apply to like, a formal argument, you know, putting this debate together. This is casual talk all the time. You can point this stuff out, and when you see it, it's good to know because whether you do it or your friends do it, you can point it out and be like, hey, I don't think that's really fair. Let's try to do it a different way. So we have 15 fallacies total. 13 of them are broader, and I think two of them may only emerge in magic. They're like specific to magic terminology, but all of them apply to magic, and we're going to get right into it with the first fallacy. It's argument from authority. It's when an opinion of an authority on a topic is used as evidence to support an argument. For an example, the nitpicking nerd said Grave Titan is bad. They are experts in the format. Therefore, Grave Titan is bad. Right. The problem with this <laughs> is that whether or not we are experts on the format doesn't actually determine what is or isn't good. Something is good or not independent of what the experts uh, or the like authorities or the commander channels have to say about it and you can make your own decisions yeah regardless of what we say about grave titan is good or is good or grave titan is bad overall whatever grave titan is medium whatever grave titan is it is that right now no matter what we say about it right now it's bad obviously because right. we, we would never be incorrect about a card because that's just i mean that's definitely not a logical fallacy yeah. in the picking nerds can never be incorrect is a truth not a fallacy true statement yeah <laughs> grave titan's bad no matter what anyone says about it yeah so what's what can we take from this what can we take from this fallacy well you just don't want to blindly follow content creators advice Try things out for yourself. Don't just take someone's word for it, basically. Um, they have more followers than you. They reach more people. They've played more games. But you can use you can use it to maybe inform a decision, but it's not true because they said so. That's the part that's a problem. Yeah, exactly. I think something um, a lot of people do is they just – we say Great Titans Bad. They're like, I, took it, I just took it straight out of my deck. It's like, but was that the only reason? Because if your if your experience with Grave Titan is that it's always good for you and it's always and it's always been supported and it is good in your meta, it is possible Grave Titan is good in your meta and we still think it's bad and it might be bad overall, but it can still be good for you. You got to take in everything. You have to consider way more than just what we said. We we love giving our opinion. And that's what we do. That's literally our jobs. But you don't, shouldn't just listen to us because we're the content creators. All right, the next one we have is the black swan fallacy, which basically is believing something you haven't witnessed doesn't exist. Uh, for example, I've never played against a good Voltron deck, therefore a good Voltron deck doesn't exist. I've heard plenty of people make these generalizations, and they're more they're more colloquial, but sometimes they're not. Yeah, um, I think a good example, and maybe somewhere where I'm biased, is like I've never played against a strong group hug deck. Does that mean a good strong group hug deck doesn't exist? Absolutely not. Um, I've literally have not played against a group hug that I would consider strong or good, in my opinion. 
that doesn't mean one doesn't exist that is stronger good in my opinion. Yeah, going on the internet and then now saying, you know, this would be the lesson part, going on the internet and saying, there aren't any good ones. It's like, well, why would we even bother like making this blanket statement? You can definitely say, I haven't seen any good ones, but you can't say I haven't seen any good ones, so there aren't any, like that's not how that works. Sometimes when I give an example in the video, people go to the comments and say, well, I've never heard anyone say that, do that, use that, whatever, and it's just like, yeah, but this is just this is the black swan. Just because you haven't witnessed it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Doesn't suddenly invalidate what I've seen or heard or said. Right, exactly. And and that's some of this. Uh, I can imagine people may or may not take away. Like, like who cares if I use a fallacy or whatever? It's like it's not really something you could brush off. Uh, using a fallacy kind of means like it's kind of like a uh, a serious word because it means whatever you're saying is not a rational statement. That you can justify it it like it literally means the thing you said is fallacious therefore like i don't like it's not the reality that's not how this works yeah and again uh just to reiterate one thing from earlier you can come to the right conclusion through a fallacy that's totally possible it's still a mistake you, it's, it's just a mistake to come to it that way right fallacy of composition assuming what is true of the parts is true of the whole all the cards in my deck are good therefore my deck is good no, in fact, this is really this is like super easy to just show an example. I love this. If you take the top sixty most played cards on EDH track and shove them in a five color pile, it'll be a terrible deck. They're all probably good cards, most likely, but the deck's gonna be awful. Right. <laughs> um, it's not fair to assume this is true. It's very possible that your deck is good and the cards are good, mm -hmm. but because there's plenty of situations where it's not true, you don't just get to say that. For example, you could play every single amazing card draw spell in the format and your deck does literally nothing because it only draws cards, right? You you don't put a lab man in your deck. You don't do anything. It only draws cards. Every card in your deck is good. Your deck sucks. Yeah, exactly. Your deck can be filled with amazing cards. And if you don't build it correctly, then the deck itself will not be good. So don't just, and this is like, I think this is something that happens a lot when players try and build competitive, super powerful decks. They kind of follow blindly and just throw cards that's like, I've seen this in CDH, I've seen this in a lot of videos, this is a really good card, I've seen this, this, and then they end up with a pile. Right. Just a pile of great, strong magic cards. They're great and they're strong that do nothing together to win the game. Or sometimes they, like, forget the closer. Yeah, exactly. Like, like, like you said, they just info not lab man, and it's like, well, now well, your deck can't win. Okay, your win percentage went from high to nothing. <laughs> yeah, we, we already said the lesson here. It's, yeah, if you just put a bunch of strong cards in your deck, that doesn't mean the deck's going to be good. Right. Uh, next, we have the exact opposite. It's the fallacy of division. Assuming what is true of the whole is true of the parts. This doesn't work the other way either. My deck is good, therefore all the cards in my deck are good. This is even easier, I think, to see that it just makes absolutely no sense. Take an amazing perfect 100 cards and literally just switch one of them out for Grave Titan and your deck is no longer full of all good cards. Yes, and also there's also tons, It's you're assuming that your deck is really good and all the cards are in are good. That's not even necessarily true, even if the card is good in the deck. So say, for example, you play um, Giant Killer. In like God Eternal Catcher. In your God Eternal Catcher good. It is good in that deck. That card is super medium. It's yeah. passable, it's okay, but it's not, I wouldn't even call it a good card necessarily. It's just in the middle. It's like mediocre. It's mediocre, exactly. Next up is the gambler's fallacy. When someone believes that a random event is more or less likely to occur based on past experiences. These, the, for an overall world example, someone's playing roulette, there's five reds in the row. Therefore, the next one is much more likely to be black. False. Right. Oh, <laughs> I'm on a bad luck streak, so I got good luck coming my way. This one's almost like just believing in luck, kind of. Uh, the magic example is a pretty pretty easy one to grasp is, I just drew five lands in a row. Next one's gotta be a non-land. Nope, it doesn't. Especially when you take into the consideration that you shuffled your deck, the cards are in a stagnant order. Uh, your chances of drawing lands go down, but the card, could you could easily just draw 37 lands in a row. Like, not easily, but it is possible and you're not owed anything. It's it, random chance. Exactly, it's random chance. The deck was shuffled randomly, put in a random order and drawing the, a card off the top of it doesn't change that card. It was already predetermined based on the random shuffling you did. You put the deck in order, yeah. randomly. It's everything, every single card is randomly selected to be in a spot already. Drawing land does not affect the next draw whatsoever. Right, you see this one too with like, uh, man, I kept, uh, I kept uh, three two-landers in a row, I got screwed. Fourth two-lander comes around, 
this one should be okay. It can't happen again. It's like, N- yes, it can. It absolutely I mean, It's can. possible that you're like 80% to hit that, and it will pretty much always happen. Yeah, I think in the lesson that I have here is that streaks happen, uh, and they're going to happen, and nothing is going to change the streaks from happening. And you shouldn't expect or get more angry when there's five lands in a row, or expect to get more angry when you don't draw a land, because... Those things are bound to happen. Here's one of the worst things I've seen people do uh, in constructed formats, which also applies to Commander. You get mana screwed, so you add a land to your deck. You get you get uh, mana flooded once, so you cut a land to your deck. We can you cannot act on such tiny, like microscopic uh, sample sizes like that. Yeah. Next, we got the questionable cause fallacy. This one is confusing correlation and causation. The cause is incorrectly identified. So we have two examples for this one. The first one is players who cast Soul Ring on turns one to three won 3.4% less than usual. Therefore, playing Soul Ring early reduces your chances of winning a Commander game. Second example, I added two lands to my deck and now I get mana screwed less. Therefore, adding more lands has caused me to get mana screwed less. Yes, I, I like the first example a lot. Um, you, Everyone knows this is a famous example from the Command Zone. Um, we're not calling anybody out, but simply put, those stats, um, the causation of somebody losing isn't them playing the Soul Ring. And you could... And it's almost impossible to ever determine that to be true. Yeah, there's just too many factors in a commander game mm. to determine that. There's a relationship between basically any two uh, items, like the number, like the correlation of players who wear green hats has, relates in some way to who wins the game, right? But picking those out and saying players with green hats win less than players with red hats just has no impact. And... It is possible Soul Ring has some impact because we're at least in the game it now. It definitely has some. But we just cannot say that playing Soul Ring early reduces your chance. Like, you just can't say that's the cause. And with the Commander Stats video, it's not like they're committing a fallacy. I think the Stats video is more meant to be like, hey, here's some fun information. Mm-hmm. Like, use it. Like, take it into your head. But you can't really draw a ton of, like, objective stances on the format from those well, stats. And the second, the second example... Um, Adding two lands to your deck and getting mana screwed less, you are less likely to get mana screwed, but you cannot say the next time you you know, draw normal lands and you don't get mana screwed that it was because you added the two lands. Those two lands could easily not be in the equation at all. You didn't draw those cards, so it doesn't matter that you added them. That wasn't the reason. The reason was the shuffle. So the Sol Ring thing, again, something, so you go to Sol Ring. The people, you can say that people aren't saying, therefore, Sol Ring uh, reduces your chance of winning. You could say people aren't saying that. What people are saying... And what I've literally heard is that playing Soul Ring doesn't increase your chance of winning. It decreases it. Therefore, it's a fair card and shouldn't be banned. Same fallacy. You're doing the same thing. You're drawing this conclusion based on something that is not necessarily causation. Right. So I just, you can't do this. Uh, Stats are fine. But when you try to relate these things without any, like, proof beyond just you say so, it's not good enough. Next, we have a rough one. I, uh, I'm i not a huge fan of the appeal to emotion fallacy. This is basically manipulation of the recipient's emotions in order to win an argument. For example, Cherries, would you like to read the first line? Uh, we would say, uh, you should cut Grave Titan if you want to increase the power of your deck. So you don't want me to have any fun? That yeah. is like just, that response is so out there and not justified at all. It has nothing to do with Joe's argument or recommendation of, hey, if you want to power up your deck, Try cutting Grave Titan. Like, that obviously has nothing to do with how much fun Joe wants me to have. It is yeah. unfair. Yeah, and we've had this before when we did videos where we suggest cutting cards for power, and people go in the comments and basically say that these guys aren't fun. They're not trying to have fun. It's like, you're trying to, like, you're trying to make us feel bad for having our opinions. Terrible way to try to go about an argument. And, if like, let's say there's a channel that, like, recommends stacks pieces. You can't go in and say... You just don't want people to have any fun. Like that's redi- that's kind of ridiculous, honestly. That's like it's like borderline an attack instead of a reasonable discussion. So that's definitely a lesson to draw. Just don't randomly attack people. Yeah. Not everyone does this, but some people do. Don't try to make someone look bad or feel bad uh, based on emotion. Just actually have a real com- conversation, debate, whatever, without trying to make anyone feel a certain way about something. Oh yeah, this is like the YouTube comments special. You could probably go to any video on YouTube with more than. 2,000 views and and find one of these in the comments. <laughs> Absolutely. What's next, Joe? Oh, it's appeal to tradition. This one is so good. Saying something is true because of past or present tradition. This one where I just, I'm skipping the first two examples. You can bring them up later. Okay. I am stuck on this, this example that we came up with the first one that I thought of. 
the rules committee says Soul Ring got us to where we are, and Soul Ring is an important part of the format in the past. Therefore, going forward, we want it to be there. It's a fallacy. It's not a. It's not a reason to want it there whatsoever. Yeah. Well, you can't say it should be there because it's gotten us here. You can say I want it to be here because that's not an argument. That's just a random opinion. But you can't say Soul Ring got us where we're at, so we should keep it in the format. Like that just doesn't track at well, all. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me. I think a good point. And so why I you can't say that is the rules as a as a rules committee as somebody who makes the rules for a format. You should be using logic to defend all your points. Obviously, you are the arbiters of the format. You are the ones making the rules. They should be logical. And if they're not logical, then we are, one, that's we're falling into a whole different place where magic is, there's something wrong with Commander that. But that's not the case. I don't think anyone's being illogical. No. Therefore, they can't use that argument. Because that argument is not helpful. It's not advancing the conversation. And it's not putting us in a place where we can determine whether Sol Ring is healthy or unhealthy for this format. Right. It just doesn't get us anywhere. It's like... Uh, well, we can use the other two. Um, Acidic Slime and Temple of the False God have been good in Commander since 2000, whatever, let's say like 1995, just in case, as an argument, 1995 to 2005. So we should keep playing them. It's like, well, no, that's not how this works. You have to evaluate them in the present day. Acidic Slime and uh, Temple of the False God, at least, especially in our opinion, uh, just don't keep up anymore. There's too many more cards. They get pushed down the power rankings and they don't make our decks. Uh, you just got to evaluate cards as a lesson by today's standards. Absolutely. It, you just have to, you have to evaluate everything based on here, now, and not what happened in the past necessarily. Right. I mean, do, do past events have an effect yeah. on what you think, say, do, or what we should do going forward? Yeah. But you can't say because we've done this already, we should continue doing it. Right. It's, it also applies with Sol Ring in power. Maybe Sol Ring sucks five years from now in Commander. Maybe it just gets pushed out by so many other cards. And there's people saying... Well, Soul Ring's been good for 25 years. You can't cut it. Yes, you can. That's yeah. not a reason. It could easily come to that point. Not right. that it's going to, it but it could. I hope not. God. I don't want to play that format. Yeah, no. All right, this next one's a little confusing. It's the appeal to ignorance. Asserting a proposition is true because it hasn't been proven false or vice versa. Sometimes it's used to shift the burden of proof, which should always rest on the person making a claim. That's a good little, like, heuristic for anything. Uh, burden of proof rests on anyone making a claim. It's not up to the other person to prove this new claim false when they just get presented with it, right? So the example, person A, Phyrexian Arena is a good card. Person B, I don't think so. Person A, you can't prove it isn't. That is not up to person B when person A just claimed that it's a good card. Yeah, exactly. They're just making a claim out of nowhere. They're just making a claim. And <laughs> when you make a claim, you're the one who has to back it up. We're just saying, eh, we don't necessarily agree. And then you tell us to prove it. It's like, well, whoa, hold on. Who said we didn't? We said we just don't agree. We didn't say that Frexian is bad or anything. We made no statement. <laughs> yeah, and one of the problems with this whole burden of proof thing is, not agreeing with something is different from disagreeing with it. So if person A says Frexian is a good card, they've made a claim. Person B says it's a bad card. They've made a claim, and they both have a burden of proof to justify it. But if person B just doesn't believe person A, they do not have to prove that they're false. It's like the uh, the real world example might be someone saying ghosts exist, and then I say I don't believe you, and they say prove ghosts don't exist. Like that's not up to me. <laughs> this is an argument or this appeal to ignorance fallacy. Exactly. Yeah. Burden of proof is just it's if you want to so look, important. If you want to look up burden of proof, there's a lot more to it. We. We're not experts on burden of proof. No. We're not. We're not even super. We're not experts on logic. We're use. We are logical people, and we use logic as much as we can. That being said, there's much more to this. If you want to, if you want to educate yourself on logic, I would suggest looking it up because there's a, a lot to learn, and it's super important to life. To me, it's like super fun. Also, uh, right there, it's like magic is number one hobby for me. Logic is like the second biggest hobby. It's so much fun understanding it because mm -hmm. you you really like start to click a lot more things, and you basically get like taken advantage of less. It's great. This next one is a false dichotomy fallacy, which is incorrectly stating which options are available. Here's an example. Either a card is good or it's bad. The correct dichotomy needs to encapsulate all possibilities and should therefore be either a card is good or it isn't good. The formula for a true dichotomy usually is A or not A. It's not A or B. So you either, here's a, here's a more, uh, drastic one you might see in a commander game. You either kill Smothering Tithe or Joe untaps and wins the game. Not even close to all of the options. You cannot say either or when you're just like so far from the truth. 
Yeah, there's a lot of gray in magic in life overall, but in magic specifically, there's just there's almost always a graveyard. There's almost no dichotomies really uh, when in day to day situations. Um, sometimes there is, but right. they're very few and far between. And in Magic, they're even fewer and far in, in further between. Sometimes you're going to come to situations like, well, I either use my removal spell to kill the, the... If I'm a two life and I have a removal spell and there's a two two damage thing attacking me, yeah, then there's a dichotomy. I either kill it with my removal spell or I die. Sure. Even that's, that... It's not a dichotomy? It's not. Because oh, you if either they, kill it with your removal spell or you don't kill it with your removal spell. That would be the true dichotomy. It's like you just can't yeah. jump to an assumption like that. Okay. Uh, I also have two other examples. One is reasonable and one is stupid. Uh, one fun one that I like that people will say a ton is you're either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. Nope. That's not how that works. You're either part of the problem or you're not part of the problem, which is like so many like you know innocent bystanders fall under the not either one. So they just can't eliminate things. And also very, very famous false dichotomy fallacy. Anakin Skywalker once said, you're either with me or you're my enemy. No, buddy, no. That's how you fall. That's how you fall into a fight with your best friend. Yeah, that's that's how you fight your best friend, and he cuts off your light. <laughs> right. Exactly. You don't. You don't want your best friend to cut off your light. And I think Obi Wan also commits one. Basically, says uh, you either deal in absolutes or you aren't a Sith. I just can't say that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, only a Sith deals in absolutes. Right. That would be. It would be. You're either a Sith or you don't deal in absolutes. <laughs> it's like whatever. That doesn't. That's not how that works. <laughs> Next is the slippery slope fallacy. A course of action is rejected because one insists it will lead to an unstoppable chain of events. This this one applies so perfectly. Here's a good one to the commander arms race. That if everyone in the play group, everyone in the play group is just going to keep increasing the power of the decks until everyone's playing CDH, and then it'll just be super high powered and no one will have fun. The reason this is just false because if you can stop at any point in in these steps, right. which you can stop at every single one of the steps, yes. Then it's then it's not a, then it's just not true, right? So you might say, don't add smothering tithe to your deck because it's just going to encourage you to add more and more cards, and then your play group increases the power level of decks until you're playing CDH, uh, you know, high power decks. And let's assume, let's even just assume that's a bad thing, which it isn't. Uh, that would imply that you're on a, like a cliff, right? And once you add smothering tithe, you fall down the hill and you just slide right you to the stop. bottom. Uh, this is actually, no, it's stairs. You step, adding some other tithe to your deck, and now you don't have to add any other cards to your deck if you don't want to. Or take a step down and add Rhystic Study to your deck. You do not have to fall down the slope, if you will. You don't, you just never, you can stop at any point, and you can also go backward, Right. actually, on these, because uh, it is a stairwell. It's not a slope. It's a stairwell. If you go super far down and you're, like, approaching CDH, Suddenly, you can start cutting cards for your deck and stepping wow. back up. This is not a slope. It, you can't. A slope also implies that you can't go back from it. Right. It's unstoppable. Once you get to the bottom, you're at the bottom, and you can't really get back up. And, but you can. Yeah, it's you just, literally can. So the moral story: it's just not fair to just to, to, uh, chain people with these like, well, if you do this, you're going to do these seven things. It's like, don't assume what they're going to do. Talk to them as a person who's going to respond to you. Be fair about everything. You can say, hey, you know, I had these buddies and. This happened. We had this arms race go on, and I just I'm worried for you. Maybe your playgroup is similar. How much more fair and reasonable is that than nope? If you do this, your playgroup's gonna hate everybody, and then you're gonna gonna die. It's like, arms, arms race can happen, and they can be negative, and they and it's in a certain group that it's possible for it to take this sort of slippery slope thing, where it does happen like that, where it's just like wow, it literally went from I put let's just say smothering tides, and all of a sudden we were playing super high power in like in like five months from now. It's like that could happen. That doesn't make it a valid argument. Right. And another uh, side note that's not even related is that isn't even always a bad thing. Yeah. Plenty of groups have the arms race and they love it. Yeah. Here's another one. Affirming the consequent fallacy. Taking a conditional statement and inferring the converse without considering other causes. Probably should go to an example for this one. There's, let's say this is the conditional statement. If your deck is poorly constructed, you will lose commander games. That's a fair statement. The fallacy version of that is... You're losing commander games, therefore your deck is poorly constructed. You flip it and you assume that that's the only cause of the you're losing commander games. Like just because it's true the other way, doesn't mean it's true this way. Exactly. If you construct a poor deck, you will lose more commander games right. because that's your deck 
fair statement. Yeah, because that deck's not good, and the deck will win less because it's constructed poorly. But just because you're losing games doesn't mean that your deck is bad. How many people say that your deck is bad because you're losing? Like, let's, this is ridiculous. You cannot say that they built their deck wrong. They could get mana screwed, mana flooded. They could get targeted, politicized. A million different ways you can lose a commander game while having a, a reasonably constructed deck. Yeah, you yeah you just can't draw this conclusion. You just you can't do that. And a lot of people do it with like you said, your deck is bad because you're losing, or my deck is bad because I'm losing. That might you could build the best deck that you could build for your situation on your budget, whatever that possible for you to build, and you could lose the first twenty five games in a row you play. Right, it is possible. There's your gambler's fallacy combo. <laughs> yeah, and so you could do that. And that doesn't mean your deck's bad. It doesn't draw, It doesn't even come close to saying that about your deck. One of the big things I think is a takeaway from this video is um, if you have people that are like firing these arguments against you, it might be hard, but at least if you didn't know this before, you know that you're at least on higher footing logically than these people. Like they're not making a coherent argument. I think it's a lot easier for me to walk away from stuff like this. Uh, even if I, like I don't have to argue with them. I can just in my head think, like, I know what's wrong with what you're saying. I'm not going to take it to heart. I know it isn't true and you can't prove it to be true. I'm just not going to bother with this. I think that helps That helps me so much. No true Scotsman. Everyone knows this one. Someone tries to protect their generalizations from a falsifying counterexample by excluding the counterexample improperly. Uh, no casual commander deck plays Mana Crypt. Uh, I have a casual commander deck with a Mana Crypt. No real casual commander deck plays Mana Crypt. Exactly. So this is so true. You can do this. Uh, this these casual like this. This becomes gatekeeping. Um, and it's and it, it happens all the time that if you play X Y Z card, you're not playing my power level. But I easily part, could you're not be. part of my tribe. I could literally build a deck that is a six. Uh, it's a six for the every card. It's made to play like a six, and it fits into a six perfectly. And throw Mana Crypt in it. That does not going to move it up a level. That's no. not how this works. This one card is not enough to affect it. Will it make my deck play smoother? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And when I draw it, it'll be very good. But that doesn't mean it's not a casual deck or it's not a six. And then you gatekeep people from playing certain things. I know that in uh, specific EDH servers, like if you play Mana Crypt, you can't be in a certain... Uh, you're, just, you're just like up four power levels, right? You can't op You can't optimize your your janky merfolk deck or something with a mana crypt. It's exactly. like this isn't going to move the needle too much. And how many times do you hear this? You can't put Armageddon in your deck. That's a stupid card. Like, if you're playing Armageddon, your deck is competitive. Like, I don't care what you say. It's like, actually, we don't care what you say. That's not how any of this works. Yeah, I've played against casual decks that are extremely janky. I mean, it turns and out there's just no line, right? Like, you're going to have to decide with your play group. There's no, like definitive thing. It turns out lines are really blurred and when people try to compartmentalize everybody and split everyone into labels and say, you're not part of us, we're against you. It's like, this is just ridiculous. That's not how people make friends or get along. Yeah, exactly. It's just, gay you're gatekeeping. You're keeping people out because they're doing one specific thing that you consider to not correlate with what you what you think for what we're talking about now, casual is. Well, uh, yeah, and it's just, it's also dishonest, right? You say, no casual deck uh, plays Mana Crypt. And then someone says, here's a casual deck with it. Now, your your options are like, oh, yeah, maybe I was wrong. Let me re reevaluate. I can say, you know, no casual deck's going to play uh, this series of combos or this whatever. Like, maybe you elaborate more. Or you could just be a jerk and say, no, that's not a real casual deck. Like, wh what? Come on. How immature. Yeah, how do you get to, why are, exactly, why do you, why does anyone get to say what a quote unquote true Scotsman is? Yeah, so dumb. Oh, now we're into the two magic specific ones. We didn't really bother looking up where they apply. We know they might that apply. these are Magic the Gathering, uh, at least base. The first one we call the Magical Christmas Land Fallacy. This is believing that a card performing well in a specific situation dictates that it performs well overall. Crossing Grip is fantastic when you play against an Aetherflux Reservoir while its controller is at 51 life, can use it with little consequences, and passes priority after casting it. Therefore, Crossing Grip is a fantastic removal spell. Whoa, hold on. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Magical Christmas Land means that you're going to create the situation where it's good. That if I do this, 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 and this, and this situation comes up, it's great in that situation. Therefore, it's just a great card. It's uh, it's also something for Magical Christmas Land. People put like three-card combos in their deck. 
that are all the cards are bad, but when you have them together, oh my god, it's so good. Right. Um, you know what this actually reminds me of, and I, there's definitely a fallacy related to this. But we're not going to go over right now what the specific name is, but it's sh you shoot an arrow uh, at the at a barn, and then you draw the target on, and so you hit a bullseye. Yeah, that's it, what it is, right? It's I the, my first choice is choosing to play Crossing Grip. And now, when I destroy this Aether, Fl Aether Flux Reservoir at 51 life, I then tell you, yeah, that was the goal. That's the target. That's what every removal spell should do. This yeah. card's amazing. It's like, exactly. No. Because just because a card, there is, just because you can create the situation where the card is good, and when you live in Magical Crystal Land, and, and even if it happens, that doesn't mean that the card is good. It's yeah. just, uh, there are situations where Crossing Grip is going to be better than Nature's Claim. It's almost never. But it certainly is sometimes. Right. We paint the targets before we shoot. So we say, what are we looking for in a removal spell? Super cheap, super efficient, two for one potential, you know, versatility. And then that's how you arrive at things like nature's claim where, it, yes, it's going to be super force of efficient vigor. every time. You know, force of wiggers, zero mana, two for one or two for two, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, exactly. So we come to those conclusions based on what we want out of the spell, not based on the situation that could come up that I made up. Right. You don't start with the spell. You start with what you want. Yeah, you, <laughs> exactly. All right, last one. My personal favorite, dies to removal! Arguing that a creature or a spell is bad because it could be answered by a removal spell or a counter spell. Example, and this is literally in our comment section, I can't even believe it. Smothering Tithe is bad because people always kill it immediately, negating its value. What? Okay, How? you want to hear another one that I just thought of that yeah. is even worse and even more in everyone's comment section? Hall Breacher shouldn't have been banned because it dies to removal. Now, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. This is literally the most insane thing. The reason this is not relevant completely used to bring up is everything dies to removal in some way. Some things are more resistant. Some things are less resistant. But bringing up the fact that it's going to be removable is not helpful. It does not indicate how powerful or good a spell is. If anything... The speed and consistency, consistency at which something gets removed is more of a testament to how good it is than proof of how bad it is. Your Smothering Tithe dies because it needs to die. Because let's check the games where it doesn't die, you run away with them. Exactly. People do kill Smothering Tithe often. <clears throat> they should, and that's the right play because right. the card is so powerful, probably one of the best white spells ever made, that it has to die right away. If you've played a game and you've seen it not get killed, you know that this card will run away with the game. I know it dies to every removal spell. Yes. I know it dies to Nature's Claim, Cross and Grip, to Force of Vigor. I know it dies to all those. Yes. That doesn't make this card worse. Right, like saying, why can't you kill a creature with two toughness? Why do they have to ban Hull Breacher? It's like, let's examine what happens when every creature with two toughness is left in play. It's like, okay, let's compare Mentor of the Meek to Hull Breacher and see what happens if neither of them is answered. It's like, well, Obviously, those situations are different. It's You're preventing disaster when you remove it. It's absolutely, it's just silly. Yeah. Super silly and doesn't have anything to do with what the actual problems are. Why is Hull Breacher a problem? It's, well, there's a million reasons. You go over them all and then you go, okay, well, what do you think? Well, you can just kill us. Who cares? Thanks. Right. Thanks for thanks for helping. It's, it's, all, it's like, man, this person like committed a crime and they're doing something bad. It's like, well, what if they were never born? It's like, I don't know. Who cares? <laughs> Does it matter? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that is our video. And I want to say here at the end, um, logic is super complex. Our logic might not have been perfect in this video. In fact, it's possible because fallacies is everywhere. They were used a fallacy. But totally. Explaining these fallacies. We're not perfectly logical people. In fact, if you found anything wrong with the video, comment. I would love that. These conversations should continue in the comment section because there is... There is, you can apply logic perfectly. It's almost impossible for any person to apply all logic li perfectly at all times. Right. But I, I can guarantee you, if you want to look out for these 15, like yeah. it's going to save you time, yep. hassle, arguments. It's going to literally win you arguments, first of all. Like, or at least, you know, you're going to knock down their tower that it turns out was built on nothing. Right. right. Like, it's just going to help you so much more quickly, like connect these dots and realize like, I don't, what's important to respond to? Like, not this, not this. Oh, here's like a, va a more valid argument that I can point to. It doesn't have any holes in it, right? These are just, you take a bunch of arguments, like, well, five of them have just holes in it. Like, I'm not gonna respond to those. I wonder, I wonder where, uh, we didn't look it up, uh, dice removal, it has to be a real fallacy, where you point out something that is, applies to 
everything. Right, everything, and then specify it's a problem with one specific. Uh, yeah, it has to be a real thing. I can't imagine that's not a fallacy. Yeah, feel free to name the magical Christmas land and dies to remove fallacies. They, they feel it just feels like they have to have real ones where it's like, hey, yeah, uh, this guy or. I can't even think of something. I guess it's so tough to think of. I guess like human. Uh, that guy has tonsils, so he's a problem. It's like, right. well, everyone has tonsils. That doesn't affect you, anything. What's your point? It, it actually affects literally nothing. <laughs> right. So go to the link in the description, <laughs> and uh, Joe's going to shout out people because I went to the link too early. Special shout outs to all of our patrons. Love you all as much as you can without making you comfortable. It's been a great month for patrons, honestly. Thank you all. All for the support, not just the new ones, but the old ones. And holy crap, we've been slacking so hard. So let's actually give a couple of patrons a shout out because we owe them. You guys are so amazing. You deserve a shout out for supporting us at a specific tier. If you want to know what that tier is, go check out the link. You know the deal. Uh, Cauldron. Yep. Kiefer A. What? Grace Graceler. I'm so good at pronouncing names. Jonah Stein McLean. Uh, just Ronnie. The one. The only Ronnie. Mechanoid, our, our personal patron. Yep, Mechanoid and yeah. Rekiu, Reka. And, and Anthony Bell. You make this extra possible. We love you, Anthony Bell. Uh, Jacob Wharton. What a classic what a, patron. Classic patron. Classic Jacob Wharton. Daniel, the one and only Daniel. The, for sure, that's a classic name. Yeah, and I know we've shouted out him before, but he's on the list, and so we'll. Nathan Mounts. What are you going to do? Reject our shout out? Deal yeah. with it. Take it. Take your second shout out, Nathan Mounts. We also have two shout-outs from our memberships. If you hit join when you go to click on under our banner on the YouTube channel, you can join and support us monthly, especially going to be relevant when we start doing upcoming live streams. Or if we premiere something, you can live chat and you get emojis and stuff. So we're going to shout-out the Kerglin Burglar. Oh, I love and, that name. And Icarus Kid with a K. I think it's Kerglin Burger, not Burglar. You're not a criminal. It's definitely Icarus Kid, though. Yes, it is definitely Icarus Kid. Thank you all. Link in the description for TCG Player if you want to support us a different way. Buy the cards, navigate, check out. Bonus for us. Amazing. Also, we have a Discord. We're in there all the time. We really got to wrap this one up. You got a tidbit? Uh, no, but before you go to that tidbit, we have <laughs> um, we have to actually mention the Kickstarter, which is running through September 21st. This is our tidbit. <laughs> this is important. No. Check it out. We got stretch goals. We got a bunch of different yes. awesome stuff. We're going for the anti nitpicking Nerds deck, and then there's two bonus ones after if we get to meet that goal. But let's start there. Really appreciate you guys' support. This is amazing. I can't believe we're going to do gameplay. It's going to be lit. Lit? Lit. Wow. And the video. You really are a zoomer. No, we have to do a tidbit. Uh, we have to? Yes, it's part oh, of our videos. Oh, man. Every time. Ugh. Yes, every These time. poor souls with this, like, five-minute ending. You got any idea? It's your turn. Is it my? I think it's your turn. It's my turn? I really do think it's your oh, turn. Oh, God. Let's just go back to logic, I guess, because we were talking about that. It's just, it's like the foundation of reality. Um some people have said before the human experience. Some people have said that like, I don't, I don't need logic or you don't need it. It's like that's actually just not true. Uh, there's the the fun like little experiment of uh, you have to assume reason is reasonable to even think about whether it's reasonable. So you just can't go around not using logic. I feel like a lot of that stuff comes up maybe over the COVID season for whatever reason. I can't remember, but maybe. Maybe we could have benefited from a fallacy analysis of, of that. Yeah. I mean, you can honestly apply logic to everything well, you life. should and also. You, you can and should apply logic to everything in life. But also, you do. Right. You just do. You do. You Sometimes just, you, you don't. Not, right. Sometimes you remove it and don't use it and don't even think about it. But you definitely use it almost all the time for everything. Right. Subconsciously. Like, we can rephrase everything you're saying to, you know, coincide with what, you know, is actually true about things. And it's really cool to think about. I definitely recommend studying up on this if you you got an hour to kill. It's, it's fun. Yeah. Uh, we're we're not, definitely not the... No, we're not God. the guys that you want to learn all the logic from. Just take your time and actually... The internet has people... Much who are more talented. Imp, much smarter. I mean, I'm willing to... Not hotter, but the first two. Definitely not hotter. There definitely are smarter people on the internet who understand logic much more that can help you. So. This is a little intro via magic. This is, uh, this is magic... Fallacies 101. Logic 101 featuring two idiots who play magic. Yeah, exactly. We're so smart. Peace out, Tribe Scout.